Happy, happy International Medical Physics Week, everyone. Very nice meeting you again. IOMP organizes a series of webinars during this uh, special week, as in previous years. So today, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Professor Kimberly Upgate, who is going to talk to us about uh, radiation and pregnancy, focusing, focusing on ICRP, uh, task group 121 work. This is about radiation induced effects for the offspring of individuals exposed to ionizing radiation. Uh, Kimberly will also discuss important aspects of uh, uh, aspects related to imaging of pregnant patients. The CV of our, our speaker um, has been uploaded on our website, a, a brief uh, biography. Uh, briefly, Kimberly is a retired professor of radiology and pediatrics from the University of Kentucky. Um, Kimberly is a member of the ICRP main commission as chair of committee three. Uh, committee three uh, focuses on radiation protection in medicine. Um, and she's also very active in various other scientific uh, organizations such as the uh, NCRP, the United States National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements. Uh, before giving the floor to Kimberly, I'd like to remind you that all webinars will be freely available. The recorded webinars are going to be uploaded on IOMP's website for those who are not able to watch them live. And for, quite, for uh, questions and answers, please use the, sorry, for questions, <laughs> please use the question, questions and answers uh, tool, Zoom tool. Uh, and one more thing, if I leave it at the end, I'll probably forget it. I'd like to thank Professor Magdalena Stoeva, our Secretary General for her technical support, and uh, Professor Chai Hong Yong for disseminating the webinars. Uh, thank you, Magdalena and Chai. So Kimberly, uh, the mic is yours. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to go right into the um, slide talk so that we do have time at the end for some uh, questions, answers, comments. Um, and I thank you so much for this opportunity because I find it, it comes up frequently with differing uh, uh, comments and answers. Let's see if everyone can see the, the slides that I have up, hopefully. John, you can confirm. Yes, I confirm. Great. Uh, let, me see, let me get these out of the way. All right. So I wanted to change a little bit uh, from the original title, perhaps the um, some of the imaging information will be toward the end. But I think what we do with pregnant women uh, depends on the science and the ethics. So I want to start uh, with that. And uh, a relatively newer task group, uh, we use numbers in the ICRP, many of you know that, um, and it's uh, task group one to one. And on the right are, um, is a photo of uh, my identical twins, which are now, who are now grown. Um, but um, because I'm a twin, my husband always said it's because of me and uh, the genetics, but I would argue it was perhaps, uh, you know, because they were conceived when I was doing fluoroscopy, uh, many years ago that uh, maybe it was a little extra energy that I got at that time. Who knows? Uh, but we always seek uh, attribution. And uh, this comes up in our discussions with families um, and what to do with the radiation uh, protection aspect. So um, just to give you an idea, the uh, ICRP Task Group 1 to 1, uh, looking at the review of what we know and what we don't know, is quite large. And uh, the co-chairs are uh, Manor uh, Prakash Hanvi and Richard Wakeford. Um, but it it's involves many people with different areas of expertise. Uh, I won't go through and name them all. Um, but I will tell you that what I'd like to cover today is to talk about the kind of unique situation of the uh, pregnant woman uh, and uh, talking with families, which is uh, grounded on the importance of ethical foundation uh, and societal values, which evolve, and um, discussing with them uh, in a shared decision-making way. And then 
review of recent ICRP, NCRP, and UNSCR publications, which is part of the mandate of Task Group 121, and we'll talk about that. And then uh, out of a workshop that we had almost a year ago to talk about some of the gaps in our knowledge uh, that we found and discussed, and then the next steps that will be involved. Um, I'll briefly mention the fetal uh, development, uh, which is tightly linked to the risk from ionizing radiation, uh, especially for uh, tissue effects. And then finally, talk about some of the imaging in pregnant women and uh, protocols, and then the estimated dosimetry. So what is our special situation? Well, I can tell you, and many of you know this uh, from working with uh, pregnant women or uh, colleagues uh, who ask you what to do or what the dose is after the fact, that it is uh, one of the most ethically sensitive issues in radiation protection uh, when we image uh, pregnant women or when we have accidentally discovered that the woman is pregnant, uh, for example, in trauma um, or in newborns. So. Um, this comes up frequently. Um, and then the second point I'd like to make is that the ICRP um, has a way of framing this topic that the protection of the fetus is broadly compared to that of a member of the public, but stops just short of calling a fetus a member of the public. And I refer you to publication 60, paragraph 177. Um, and, and then in, in publication 84, which is the a publication where we talk about uh, radiological protection of uh, the pregnant woman uh, in in a very nice short question and answer type format, uh, we talk about balancing the risk and the benefit to the mother and sometimes balancing the benefit to the mother with the small risk to the fetus. So it's a very uh, good way of, of uh, looking at this. And all of our publications are, by the way, free to you, uh, if except for the most recent two years of our publications. Um, and then point three, pregnant women are more, we believe, more radiosensitive than non-pregnant women to, uh, to radiation. Um, and they can have higher risks of some uh, medical conditions and I'll talk more a little bit later about that. But they also have common conditions that we all have, like appendicitis and pneumonia, that we may have to do some imaging for. Um, they also have a lumbar uh, disc herniation. They have myocardial infarct, a pulmonary embolism, deep vein thrombosis, aneurysmal bleeds. Um, these are at higher rates, especially in the head uh, and in the abdomen, like in the spleen. And they also definitely have more renal stones. So um, the final point uh, in this special situation where shared decision-making is so important with patients, families, and our colleagues in healthcare is um, to think about how we communicate. Um, and I uh, really like the Colin Powell uh, kind of uh, quote, which is, tell me what you know, tell me what you don't know, and then tell me your opinion. Um, and I think that's how uh, clinical uh, physicians operate in how they deal with patients. And uh, so it's important that they provide what they know about the science and then what their opinion is based on their experience um, and, you know, their, uh, their knowledge of science. So I'll tell you up front, I'm not a radiation biologist and I'm not a radiation epidemiologist, but I'm going to try to summarize what we uh, have been doing in the task group and what I have uh, learned in uh, pediatric radiology and in um, fetal imaging as well. So in the ICRP, we currently have uh, general recommendations that were published in 2007. Uh, it's publication 103, and we uh, considered the effects of exposure uh, in utero. Uh, we, this included heritable effects, uh, but it did not include the transgenerational effects on non-human biota, the, the uh, 
those are non-mutation or non-DNA effects. Um, so we're considering whether to include those in the new uh, general recommendations. So the ICRP is undergoing a revised assessment um, of the effects of ionizing radiation in offspring and next generations, so preconception and postconception effects. Um, and this will take um, a decade, perhaps. So let's talk about what we have used in um, for quantification of heritable effects. Um, this goes back to publication 83, an unsecure publication. This is all information that I can provide to you. Um, and it's also in publication 103, summarized. So this is the big, long uh, equation. I'm not going to go through it, but um, committee one. Uh, certainly uh, is aware of this um, and uh, it has uh, different uh, metrics in terms of looking at the doubling dose in mice, um, transfer from mice to humans, um, baseline frequency of effects in humans, um, and it looks out over uh, genetic uh, damage over two generations. We're wondering, is that enough? Um, and uh, are these risk estimates still fit for purpose? So these are some of the questions we're asking. And another way to look at this is to look at how much of the overall um, stochastic risk uh, is, or stochastic effect, I should say, after radiation exposure at low dose rate um, is the heritable effect versus uh, the cancer. And it's a very small amount um, and you can look at that over a whole population or over the adult worker population. Um, and that also can be found in the ICRP um, publication 103. So it, it's only if you're on the very conservative side, up to 4% of the total uh, radiation detriment. That just gives you some idea of um, where we are. So again, we're asking, is this still fit for purpose today? So the task group 1021 mandate uh, has several uh, questions that we're asking. We want to review the preconceptional effects due to the exposure of parents. And the last time this was updated was over 20 years ago uh, in the uh, ICRP and the UNSCURE reports. Um, also to review the post-conceptional effects of radiation due to exposure of the embryo and fetus. Again, last updated in 2003, so that's 20 years ago. Um, the NCRP had a report that's more recent, uh, Report 174, which we're also looking at. And then review knowledge on transgenerational effects in wild species. Again, uh, last updated uh, in publication 124. And then finally, after we've looked at all of this, just think about how this feeds into the system of radiological pr protection and advice. Um, so we held a workshop almost a year ago. Uh, this is a picture of the brochure. And we had 52 participants from 21 countries and broke out into four groups. And um, we had some questions that we asked the groups, uh, generate a lot of discussion and came away with what are, what are some conclusions and what are some gaps in our knowledge. So that's what I'd like to talk about. Uh, first, I wanted to have some definitions of preconceptional, preconceptional exposure of germ cells before fertilization. And this is, parents ask this a lot. Um, you know, what's my risk? I just had a fluoroscopy study. Uh, should I try to get pregnant? Um, this, this is something that both men and women ask. Um, and so uh, we don't know the answer to that for sure. Uh, so um, anyway, hereditary, also called inheritance or biological inheritance is passing on of traits from parents to their offspring. Um, and genetic effects are uh, ones that uh, are mutations in the DNA. Now, epigenetic effects, uh, and I uh, want to bring this to your attention because these are uh, effects that we haven't 
uh, known a lot about, and it's a really burgeoning field. Uh, there are the inheritable phenotypic changes that do not involve alterations in the DNA sequence. And I am no expert, but I will tell you that uh, we really want to know more about that. And in animal studies, there's been some uh, really interesting uh, work uh, done, but not a lot with radiation. So uh, some new knowledge on radiation effects during the last two decades. I'm just going to highlight maybe three things. Um, there's been a reappraisal of uh, congenital malformations in perinatal deaths, also called um, uh, un, uh, unwarranted or uh, not good perinatal outcomes among the children of atomic bomb survivors by Yamada et al. And um, the radiation was associated was, with some increased risk of these uh, poorer outcomes, but the estimates uh, were imprecise because they didn't have, this is way back in, you know, decades ago, uh, they didn't have uh, good uh, data to work with. Um, and so they were not statistically significant, but they trended toward uh, uh, positive effects. So that's something to keep in mind. And then there were some, there have been direct analyses of mutations by comparing uh, parents and offspring. These are the TRIO studies. Um, and looking at the Chernobyl uh, workers, uh, cleanup workers, um, there was a lack of transgenerational effects. So that's uh, reassuring. And then Nori Nakamura, who's a member of our task group, uh, has written about why genetic effects of radiation are observed in mice, for example, but not in humans. And most recently, he's, he's hypothesized why it's so difficult to detect in humans as compared to animals. Um, so the new knowledge uh, about epigenetic inheritance uh, is something that we really don't have a lot of research on for radiation. And this is an open field. We know that there are many factors that cause epigenetic alterations, including aging, nutrition, alcohol, metal exposures, benzene, air pollutants. Um, so it's a fruitful area for more research. I'll leave it at that. I want to take a little bit more time and talk about uh, fetal exposures um, and health effects. And a few papers that have come out in the past five years uh, that are of interest uh, that you might all want to be aware of. Um, Hatch uh, and colleagues uh, looked at the neonatal outcomes of uh, the pregnant uh, or the in utero, um, uh, the pregnant women uh, from Chernobyl and found that there were smaller head sizes and chest sizes, but normal birth weights uh, and longer gestations. Um, and of course the I-131 exposures uh, had, had higher, uh, higher thyroid dysfunction and cancers. Um, and Sugiyama um, looked at the RERF in utero outcomes. So this is many decades after their um, radiation exposure and, have con and noted that there is continued increased solid tumors into late adulthood for females, but when adjusting for other uh, factors not in males, I'm not and they're not sure why, but there are complex factors of smaller birth weight, smaller head size, and I put that in red to show you that that is similar to what Hatch found in their Chernobyl outcomes, um, and uh, also parental loss that influenced the outcomes. So there's some interesting factors uh, that they are still looking at. And then finally, uh, some of you may be aware of Richard Wakeford and Bethel, who published in 2021 
a longer follow-up and uh, analysis, complex analysis of the Oxford uh, survey and um, case control studies looking at um, the uh, pelvimetry of uh, prenatal uh, radiation exposures and then also uh, other uh, childhood outcomes of radiation uh, where uh, the pelvimetry dose estimates were six to 10 milligram at that time, this is, you know, in the 1950s, uh, which approximates a modern single phase abdomen pelvis CT. Um, I'll just point that out. Um, and the uh, risk um, uh, in, in their paper showed about 6% per gray up to age 15 years for leukemia in children and in most childhood cancers, not in bone not for bone cancer in children. So this was consistent across the papers that they analyzed uh, and supports the notion that uh, children uh, and uh, fetal exposures uh, are at increased risk. So um, we'll come back to that again. So what are the effects on non-human biota? Well, there were a number of knowledge gaps found at this Budapest workshop. Um, it, it data on heritable effects are not included in the general ICRP recommendations yet, but I think there are a number of, uh, of people at the workshop and, and also in another task group, 125, uh, looking uh, at this. Um, and they note that generation times vary so much in, in animal and plant species from a life cycle of 20 days for worms um, to 1,000 years to, for some really long living trees. Um, and exposure times for biota and long contaminated areas um, uh, can see long term exposures uh, where there's multi generational uh, also exposures. So there's a lot to consider. Um, there's environmental perspectives like uh, ecologically relevant effects. Um, how do we account for historical doses? How many generations should be studied? So there were discussions about two, three, four uh, generations. Um, and are these changes reversible over time? And to what extent are these findings general for all, bio, all biota and even for humans? You know, how similar do the different animal species, for example, have to be? Um, and then uh, trying to say, how does this uh, fit into the system? How do we take the information and think about the system? Um, the impact on the assessment of harmful radiation uh, is thinking about how will the calculation of the detriment change, uh, both for um, the uh, genetic or the heritable component and the um, uh, the stochastic component, or the, the sorry, the cancer component. Um, how will we characterize uh, the tissue reactions, and, and then um, the impact on operational radiological protection um, includes consideration of what's happening now with the exponential rise in medical exposures. Um, and certainly in the number of studies being done. And then concerns about potential effects for the public, the workers and patients. So it's all of these groups. Um, and then the ethical aspects are right now being um, assessed uh, by uh, Task Group 109, and that's out for public uh, comment. So I hope you'll take a look at that task group draft. So the preconceptual exposure of germ uh, cells um, or the gonads, um, the group that looked at that and asked questions identified a number of knowledge gaps. And I'm not going to read to you all of these things, 
but uh, all of these uh, knowledge gaps on the right hand side of this slide. But I just wanted to show you that there were many things that they um, they identified. Um, so I, I'm just going to say that these will be some of the research areas that um, they may look into. And in terms of what may be more relevant for those of us in the practical side of radiological protection, uh, these were some of the, the discussion items that came up in our group. And uh, for fetal exposures, one of the, uh, the things that came out of our review was to think about whether um, the CNS uh, data, uh, whether there is an IQ uh, effect that doesn't have a threshold. And um, when we look back at the data, this came up, several of us questioned that because it's, it's, it's based on so few number of people from the atomic bomb uh, data. So that's something that we question and wanted more information about. Um, the second is cancer risk um, in terms of epidemiology versus real cases. And we'll come back to that. The third is um, from ICRP publication 79, um, looking more carefully at genetic susceptibility to cancer um, and looking at that tumor suppressor gene deficiency, which may reduce tumor latency, not just increase, to, uh, increase um, susceptibility to cancers. Um, so it's a different way of thinking about it. And then um, I just have a picture of a human blastoid at age 13 days from a nature publication, which um, was uh, put discussed because of the uh, availability of of this as a research vehicle for looking at infertility. Um, it could also be used as a research vehicle for the radiation effects. It cannot be um, kept past eight, uh, 14 days, um, but it could be used to understand uh, radiation health effects. Uh, so I just bring it to your attention. There are new ways to think about understanding or radiation health effects. Um, other things for us to think about in the practical side, uh, once we have completed some of these scientific reviews, is that imaging and therapy protocols are evolving and that we, um, we think of the fetal cancer risk from ionizing radiation to be approximate to the young child. And one of the new things uh, that we need to factor in is that there was the Lancet Oncology paper by uh, Michael Hopman and colleagues uh, from December, 2022, uh, which uh, was the EPI-CT cohort study showing a dose-dependent risk of brain cancer in children and, and adolescents from a, from a single head CT um, and upward. Uh, and I think, that's important for us to consider in our uh, risk evaluation. Um, and also, we know that gonadal and fetal shielding is not recommended. And I want to bring to your attention that there is an NCRP subcommittee uh, 413, which is new, and it's evaluating the literature and recommendations for patient shielding, including guidance on field fetal shielding, and the chair is Rebecca Millman. So uh, that will be helpful, I think, in our understanding. And then um, I think there's a potential role of artificial intelligence for individual dose modeling and risk assessment. And there's a new task group uh, in the ICRP 128, and the chair is Simon Buffler. So uh, that could uh, be you know, something they consider. Um, and finally, another task group uh, is uh, 126, sorry for all the numbers, which is the protection of, of uh, research volunteers, uh, which has been uh, uh, a question about how much uh, exposure they should have. 
So with all of this, there's a special issue in preparation in the International Journal of Radi Radiation Protection, um, and there are about 15 articles expected, and we hope it will contribute to the next general recommendations. So the next topic I want to cover is the radiation uh, exposure and the effects on the embryo fetus and the, the importance of the timing of the exposure uh, to the growing fetus. It's really, really important. So if we look at the top of the graph here, uh, it's it gives the days post-conception and then the different colored uh, lines on the graph. And we first have the all or none phenomenon of prenatal death um, really before implantation. Um, so that is the effect is if the exposure occurs early, it's all or none. Whereas if the exposure occurs uh, during organogenesis, it's more one of neuropathology um, or growth re uh, retardation uh, or some malformations. Um, later on in more third trimester, um, those risks uh, go away or are, are much decreased. Um, and the, um, whereas the carcinogenic risk uh, is felt to be the same throughout uh, fetal life. So we have thresholds for the uh, tissue effects or uh, non-cancer effects. And I talked about pre-implantation. Now the uh, early or major organogenesis period has a threshold of 250 milligray and the most radiosensitive period or late organogenesis, eight to 15 weeks, has a uh, dose threshold of 100 milligray. So I want to mention that there's a lot of variability in the human uh, species uh, where, um, you know, funeral demise depends not only on the age, but also on the individual. And when I performed a review, I found uh, that, um, well, there were therapeutic abortions in the 1930s using radiation. And uh, these were performed according to the, a report that uh, they could not be, uh, these women could not undergo surgery. So they had radiation. Uh, and the protocol from what I could understand was a three to five grade dose performed over two days, which resulted in abortion uh, at uh, 30 days later. Um, and another uh, uh, article I was able to find is that there is tolerance uh, for radiation um, in later uh, pregnancy uh, when radiotherapy patients um, had, had to have radiation in their pelvis or in their abdomen and pelvis, it resulted in relatively high doses to the fetus up to 8.5 gray. And this is a very old paper in the, in the radiation therapy literature. Uh, it was scant on details, but I wanna bring it to your attention and to tell you that doses can be quite high. And yet um, the, the mother and the child survived um, and they were, um, mostly for cervical cancer of the uterus and uh, lymphoma. And uh, these, this, this uh, case series reported that the neonates were normal or even survived early childhood. So there is variability. Now, I'll mention the CNS effects. Uh, I'm not gonna go through uh, great detail, but of the around 2000, uh, in utero cohort from the atomic bomb uh, survivors, there uh, was an assessment of decreased IQ uh, 25 point, points per gray uh, in the most radiosensitive period. But 
the um, late school performance was reduced. Seizures and I'm sorry about that. <sighs> Seizures and behavioral effects, brain heterotopia, neuronal depletion, and disorganized synapses, and many more studies in the animals. Um, I want to move on to uh, imaging so that we have time to um, talk about this um, for pregnant women. And uh, we talk a little bit about this in Task Group 108. Um, our host, uh, John Demolakis, has also participated in this uh, task group, parts one and two. And uh, we a note that the most common reason to image uh, pregnant women is in trauma. And sometimes we pick up unexpected early pregnancies uh, at that time. And uh, the other is CT for pulmonary embolism, where we do CT uh, arteriography. The other is uh, head CT. And finally, abdomen and pelvis CT for pain, looking uh, for uh, appendicitis uh, or renal stones or other or bowel obstruction. So there are a number of things that we uh, do imaging and sometimes directly uh, uh, exposing the fetus. So, but there are a range of doses depending on the protocol, the technique, um, the equipment, and the experience of the local facility. So it's important to look uh, at the uh, coverage and the best practices so that, um, you know, the, the indication uh, is clear and the, um, you use the best equipment available. And if you don't need to use uh, CTN, you can use uh, MRI, for example, or ultrasound, um, then, of course, that would be ideal. Now, I want to give you some recent examples of papers um, that are publications that um, show some doses. Uh, one is um, in the medical physics uh, literature, which is uh, by Matsunaga et al., um, which uh, looked at, I thought, a very helpful uh, scenario, which was when uh, women, pregnant women, have to have IVC filter placement. Uh, for protecting the pulmonary arteries after it had a deep vein thrombosis in the legs. And they modeled a six-month fetus and a nine-month fetus scenario and uh, what the doses to the fetus, um, the whole fetus, and then the brain of the fetus would be at six and nine months. And it's, um, you know, it, it's... Uh, a, uh, a reasonable dose that we would want to disclose to uh, the family. And of course, it would depend on the positioning and the size of the mother and other uh, factors, the equipment that is available. But it's good to know this information so that you can refer to it. Um, the second is from um, another group that published in the Korean Journal of Radiology, estimating uh, radiography and CT of the abdomen and pelvis from the first week to the 20th week of gestation. Um, and these are data from multiple facilities in Turkey. And uh, the doses were, you know, higher. They were, you know, about an average of 6 milligray to 22.9 milligray. And then finally, there's uh, there are a number of uh, publications looking at interventional uh, fluoroscopic guided procedures, and I picked some of the higher uh, doses that would involve, you know, the pelvis, the abdomen, pelvis, uh, to show what people have done to uh, determine the doses, either through modeling or through um, case series publications. Um, and uh, one paper is by Fabe uh, uh, in radiographics. It's a little bit dated. It's from 2012. 
And uh, for some reason, they converted their doses to effective doses in their table. Um, and there's information in this uh, uh, open source publication. And then the, uh, but you can see that if you do bilateral uterine artery embolization, the doses can be fairly high. Uh, and then uh, if you don't use ultrasound for percutaneous drainages, um, the doses can be somewhat high. And then finally, um, there's a new kind of technique that uh, is um, available for uh, at the time or just before cesarean section, uh, placement of balloon occlusion in both internal iliac arteries. And this is usually done for uh, women who have um, abnormal placentas like a, a creta or a bleeding, and it's to save them from having um, um, the uterus removed, uh, or sometimes they're bleeding already and they're trying to save them um, so that they can have another pregnancy, perhaps. So, um, but you can see that the doses are quite high. So another note about uh, CT and the upward trend in pregnant women. This is in North America. So it may be very different in your part of the world. Um, this is a, a, a paper by Mayo Smith published in Radiology in 2009, uh, where the CTDI vol was a average of 4.3, so quite low, but it ranged up to 44. Um, and then um, they showed an upward trend. It had doubled in numbers in that decade. It'd be good to see an update. So the update <laughs> is um, a two decade uh, uh, cohort that involved both the United States and Canada by um, Quan et al. in JAMA Network Open, published in 2019. And it, it showed that of um, all pregnant women, 0.8% um, of American women, pregnant women, and 0.4% of Canadian women underwent a CT scan of some type. And 5.3% of pregnant women and 3.6% of Canadian women underwent some sort of imaging using ionizing radiation. So it's much higher than I think I would have expected and perhaps you as well. And I know they're working on some sort of dosimetry related to this imaging. Nuclear medicine, I want to mention, because one in 1,000 pregnant women will get cancer diagnosed. And most commonly, this is breast, and it's about a third. Also, lymphoma, thyroid cancer, and melanoma. And some of these women need radiation therapy during pregnancy. And there's information about uh, what the dose to the uh, fetus will be. Um, and some nuclear medicine exams for staging may be um, optimized and recommended by up-to-date multidisciplinary clinical groups. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One is a modified protocol for sentinel lymph node biopsy using radiocolloids. Um, this is going to be safe and recommended for breast cancer patients and in some melanoma patients, but the facility has to know how to do this technique in non-pregnant patients. So they have to have experience doing this. They can't just do it for this special situation. Um, and I have a reference for that. Um, finally, I want to uh, bring to your attention that um, radiation exposure and medical imaging should be, again, shared uh, a shared decision-making one, and we should disclose uncertainties. And the example, a final example of this is that we have uh, cancer predisposition syndromes in both children and adults. Um, and this, this was uh, first mentioned in our publication 79. We have a new task group 111 that is uh, looking uh, to update some of this information. But there are also uh, websites. Um, the OMIM registry looks at uh, syndromes that um, um, have predisposition for cancers. Um, but there are some, some of these um, uh, are radiosensitive 
end, it's not just ataxia, telangiectasia that many people are aware of, but others, um, like trisomy 21. And there's one report that showed that BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, uh, who had an x-ray as children had later um, breast cancer uh, risk, and this was published in 2006. So it's not that they can't have uh, ionizing radiation imaging. It's just that we need to be aware that they may be more sensitive. So I want to stop here because uh, we want to be able to have some question and dialogue uh, because there are so many other things that we uh, may want to cover. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. A very nice, informative uh, presentation, excellent uh, coverage of all topics, many topics. And we have a great audience of 1,500 to 1,600 uh, people. <laughs> huge, huge audience and uh, excellent questions, some, some uh, great questions. Um, I'll try to combine some of them because time is very limited. Uh, so there are some specific and some general questions. One question is, um, can you say a few things? Can you mention the guidelines for dose optimization for pregnant patients? Um, it's a huge topic, how to optimize uh, examinations because there are many modalities, but would you like to um, right. Well, some of convey it, a short message. You're right. Well, some of it I mentioned, and some of it we mentioned in Task Group 108. But some of it is really um, depends on your local uh, situation, and your your national guidelines. Um, hopefully, you have them. You know, anytime there are more radio sensitive populations, like in children or in pregnant women, I would urge you to have, um, you know, to establish. Uh, protocols for the common conditions that I, I kind of listed on the slides um, uh, for pregnant women um, so that you are ready to go with them. And there's no doubt that CT pulmonary um, and geography is the way to go for, for, for PE and ultrasound of the, you know, of the legs, um, you know, or arms if it comes to that for uh, PE and not, you know, you, you don't hesitate to do, um, yeah, CT in these cases because um, outside of the abdomen pelvis, you know, the the exposure to the fetus is tiny. Uh, so uh, there, there's, again, there's that's why we're moving away from shielding, you know, uh, fetal shielding and gonadal shielding uh, because it's, it's really about internal scatter. Um, and this, this is going to be, you know, taking time for all of us to understand that. Um, and um, uh, protocols for, say, for pneumonia. Um, you know, a lot of places will, when we know that the woman is pregnant, we will only do one view, not two views, um, in, in at least in North America. Um, all right. Yeah. The best way to reduce those, for example, in computer tomography, is to reduce the number of faces. Right. Uh, obviously, the dose optimization uh, matter is very, very broad. Um, there are two questions about uh, fetus dose estimation. So one is how can, can we evaluate the fetus dose using TLD and fandoms? And another question, is there any way we can measure radiation or calculate the dose received by the fetus during a certain diagnostic procedure? Uh, this is obviously very important for medical physicists. Uh, well, would, you would you like me to answer that question? Or <laughs> you can answer that. I think some of those papers, they did yeah. it two ways. They, um, they did uh, Monte Carlo uh, modeling, um, and some of them did uh, put some uh, um, uh, dosimetry uh, devices right uh, directly on the abdomen of the women. So I think it depends. I, I, I can't tell you how each of them did the dosimetry. Some of them took it, actually, I do know some of them took it directly from the machine, which is not a very uh, accurate estimate. And then um, 
uh, looked in more detail from there. So I think the Monte Carlo modeling is going to be better. AI will be perhaps add some even more detail. So you may want to talk more about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, this is, yeah. We have many, many ways to, to measure uh, doses, conceptus doses. As you mentioned, Kiberly, uh, one, uh, probably the best way is Monte Carlo simulation and mathematical fandoms, but this needs some kind of expertise. It is uh, more for research purposes. Uh, same uh, applies to TLDs and uh, thermoluminescent dosimetry and, and fandoms. You, you have to have fandoms and uh, TLDs, which is not always the case, but uh, there are easier, easier ways. For example, there are tools uh, web-based tools, um, they, they can uh, be used for conceptus dose estimation and also uh, methods published in the literature, I mean, normalized data. Um, so for, for a, uh, a broad range of, uh, of examinations, uh, you can find people, colleagues can find normalized doses, normalized to CTTI, for example, for compute tomography or to any other dose metrics uh, for uh, interventional radiology or radiography. So they can use these methods to estimate doses or uh, tools, as I have already mentioned, um, uh, software tools uh, to, to calculate doses. And there is another question, uh, I think, you mentioned, and this is a question uh, from one colleague from the audience. Uh, why is a pregnant woman more radiosensitive than a non-pregnant woman? Well, um, that's actually a little bit of an understudied area. But um, I say that because they have more estrogen um, and more hormones in general than a non-pregnant um, a woman, so um, you know her her breasts tend to be more radio sensitive. So, you know, I want us to be careful. You know, about you know, there's there's no need to do mammogram when she's pregnant unless she has a mass. Then, of course, we would you know want to to evaluate that for her breast cancer. Uh, so, so there's an there, that's an example of. Um, or do an MR for, for, for that matter. So that's an example. It's, it's based on hormones, I believe. I don't, I'm not the expert, um, but that's the information I have. This is a very interesting uh, point. I don't know if it is uh, true or not. Uh, I think this is an unexplored area. Uh, not very well explored. We don't really know. The, uh, we cannot be certain, right? Um, yeah, I mean, but... I'll just say that when um, adolescent girls go through puberty, they are, it's been shown that um, they have a much higher risk of radiation um, effects. Um, and this was shown in the atomic bomb population that they have a higher uterine cancer and breast cancer risk. So it's something to keep in mind. Yeah, very, very, very uh, interesting um, area for research. Um, another question is about MRI and uh, the effect on, of MRI on um, uh, embryos, fetuses, and neonates. Um, there are no proven risks, right? Oh, for MRI? Yeah. Oh, well, here's the thing with MR. I mean, there, there are risks for everything. And, and uh, there's anesthesia. Um, anesthesia agents have been, uh, have, there's some concerns about um, a cognitive uh, effects with repeated use. So some there's some question about that in the uh, young children. Um, and then uh, gadolinium. Use. Exactly. Gadolinium, yeah. So, so with the deposition of the free gadolinium uh, in the brain and other tissue. So um, we want to be careful with that. We're, we're aware of that. But there's no reason why MR wouldn't be a good agent for, you know, not for, uh, for the mother if we, need it, if we needed it. All right. So 
gadolinium at any time during pregnancy is associated with uh, an increased uh, risk. I think this is a good message for medical physicists because um, in everyday clinical practice, we have pregnant patients undergoing MRI uh, examinations and uh, sometimes, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was, I think, over a million uh, pregnant women studied who had MR in Canada. Sorry, I didn't put that reference in. And they had, um, some had gadolinium and some didn't. And the, the uh, neonatal outcomes or the infant outcomes uh, were that they, they had no, um, you know, uh, neuro risk, but they had inflammatory disease risk, which I thought was really interesting. So uh, rheumatologic and other, and I don't know how long they followed them, but I thought that was really interesting. Kimberly, uh, needless to say is that we are receiving uh, hundreds of uh, uh, messages about your excellent presentation. One, uh, right now I can see a message, this excellent presentation shows the importance of making stronger links between ICRP and organizations, things like that. Uh, so, but uh, we still have, I think, one or two minutes for one question, more question. Um, uh, one question is very important. I mean, the answer is very important. When do you think it is appropriate to recommend abortion for dosimetric reason, reasons? Uh, well, is there we any? Don't, yeah. We don't recommend That's, it. So we don't recommend exactly. it. So, but, yeah. but we tell people that that 100 um, milligray uh, exposure, uh, we can, uh, it's a threshold uh, at which we can see, um, you know, a an, an neurologic, um, you know, effects. Neurologic, yeah. But but keep it, keep in mind though that remember that in the Chernobyl cohort, um, there were many women, sadly, that. Um, got abortions who did not reach that level. And um, it's, it's unfortunate. So uh, uh, it, this is not a, a, this is just a general thing. And I, um, I've also uh, seen this uh, in just part, the medical practice. So um, people do this for what, for reasons other than radiation exposure. Um, so um, we have to make sure we're clear, right? The Colin uh, Powell statement, we have to be clear in, in what we know and what we don't know. And so, um, you know. I, yeah, I think the best way to close this presentation is to uh, send a, a very clear, as you said, message to our audience related to this last question uh, that below 100 milligram conceptus dose, uh, abortion is not recommended, point one. Point two, um, it is very important to, for, for everybody to understand that doses above 100 milligram from diagnostic radiation examinations are very rare. So even from computer tomography examinations, we very rare uh, have doses uh, higher than 100 milligram, embryo or fetus doses. Right. So abortion, generally, yeah. Yeah, I showed you that it, even exactly. in the highest report, I showed you the highest that were reported and they were, well, published, they were, you know, 30 something, 35, yeah. Uh, okay, I think to answer all questions, uh, we need another. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pete, please feel another free web, to email web, both of us because John is an expert at this. He's well, a I, lot about it. I, uh, difficult to say expert. It's not uh, expert. Is a very uh, uh, well. I have spent some years on this topic. Yeah, uh, it is true. So, okay, Kimberly, many many thanks for for this excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank all um, participants for their active participation. Again, uh, happy International Medical Physics uh, Week. 
and everyone and see you tomorrow same time